you know, the question is, why didn't Xerox just start the personal computer revolution right there? And that's always been the question. Why didn't they come to dominate the computer market? Why was it Apple and IBM who did? There's lots of finger pointing about that. But I think the fundamental reason... This is Sachin. And this is Eric. Welcome to Luminary, kitchen table style conversations with some of the world's brightest minds exploring boundaries of human knowledge. Join us on a pursuit to transmit intuition and ideas. Find us at luminary.fm or on Twitter at luminaryfm. We would love to hear from you. Why are technology and software an integral part of change and shaping the world around us? We seek to dissect this question in the second season of Luminary. It's arguably at the heart of defining our trajectory as a civilization. Through a vast series of topics, our ambition is to weave a narrative incorporating a social, technical, historical, and philosophical lens, with contributions from titans of technology, theorists, builders, and tinkerers alike. If you have ideas, feedback, or simply suggestions for who to talk with, drop us a line on Twitter. The spirit of this journey is collaborative and community-oriented. Our third and final episode with Mitch includes the story behind the intellectual forefather of the internet and interactive computing, JCR Licklighter. This was the first recording we did with Mitch, which covers a sprawling and wide range of topics, including JCR Licklighter's role in the research and engineering of personal computing, Xerox PARC and the personal computing revolution, contributions from Alan Turing and Norbert Wiener, adoption of TCP IP, and the nature of software and computing. When it comes to the history and the development we've seen around, around ourselves, computing and software, where we are today, there is a person by the name of JCR Licklighter, who's Mm -hmm. played a major role in getting us here. Who was JCR Licklighter and what was his vision? Well, he was born in 1915, a year after my mother, actually. And uh, in Missouri, he was a psychologist, but these days probably call him a neuroscientist. He studied the auditory system, the auditory parts of the brain. During World War II, he was at Harvard University and got caught up in war-related work like uh, everybody else. It was work for the Air Force or the Army Air Corps, as it was then. problem they were trying to grapple with was the fact that the uh, airplanes that pilots were operating in were so noisy that it was hard to think, much less hear each other. So he was working on that. Uh, He helped devise the earmuff things, the headphones that uh, shielded uh, ears from uh, the noise, developed uh, techniques for modifying radio broadcast, actually make the speech easier to understand in a noisy environment. But in the course of doing this, this required him to think a lot in terms of how humans and technology interacted and how the technology could help people, the pilots in this case, and the uh, air crew operate better. So this was still a fairly new kind of question to be asking in those days. The, The whole notion of human factors was just emerging, part because of aircraft. Back in the 30s, they had realized that, and during the war, they realized that a lot of pilot caused crashes were in fact due to the fact that the instruments had not been designed with human capabilities in account. So people were, you know, couldn't tell the knobs apart just by feel, things like that. And it was just so complex that it was easy to make mistakes. So this whole notion of human factors was emerging at that time. And his work was very much part of that. Now, this is important because later on, you know, after the war, he 
eventually moved to MIT, just across town in Cambridge. And at almost exactly that time, this is about 1950, in the wake of Soviets uh, exploding their first atomic bomb, which scared the dickens out of everybody uh, in the U.S. because the Soviets were supposed to be much further behind than that. Anyway, so Stalin exploded the, his first atomic bomb. So the notion of air defense became really critical. At the time, there there weren't intercontinental ballistic missiles, which came along a few years later, but they were very worried about waves of Soviet bombers coming over the North Pole to attack us. So the Air Force uh, launched a crash program to develop uh, advanced radar, a uh, whole radar system that could watch for these bombers. And this uh, gave MIT the commission to uh, basically develop it. The reason they went to MIT is because a group there, starting during the war at almost exactly the same time as the much more famous ENIAC, which is considered the first electronic computer, uh, ENIAC was down at the University of Pennsylvania. That was for calculating artillery tables. But MIT had started developing for the Navy, in this case, a an all-electronic flight simulator. Now, in those days, a flight simulator meant a a real physical cockpit that someone would be in and it would you know, move the cockpit and you know, some training pilots, but it was electronically con controlled. And to do that, they created a computer that was the world's first real time computer, meaning that, uh, and actually they expanded it beyond the flight control application uh, very quickly. But uh, the idea was that if you did something, say in the flight simulator, the computer had to respond instantly. Otherwise, it's not a realistic simulation. The computers that had been built originally and uh, dominated well into the 60s and 70s, what we now call mainframes, had been conceived as gigantic desktop calculators. They were just very, very fast, but they you essentially you submitted your calculation, your job on a bunch of punch cards, and I'm old enough to actually remember punch cards, and it would process it. And then once it got done, it, uh, they'd give you back your answer on fanfold printout. But it was essentially the same thing as you did with a desktop calculator. You'd punch in the numbers and pull the crank and there it would go. But notion of a real time computer, which responded instantly, it had to be designed very, very differently. It had to have a whole bunch of pre program responses, but wait to get you know, the input and then uh, do the response. So they built this thing and actually occupied a small house on the MIT campus. It was called Whirlwind, you know, zillions of uh, vacuum tubes, of course, and so forth. Uh, and people worked with it, you know, well into the early 50s. It was arguably the first personal computer because if you were at MIT, you could sign up for 15 minutes on this thing and uh, and it had a little display and a uh, cathode ray tube display. And you could use that time to, you know, type in a program, you know, experiment with the program, see what it did, and it would interact with you in real time, you know, which is, think about it, that's a radical idea. If your entire concept of a computer is a calculating machine, then responsiveness just doesn't even enter into the picture. You know, turnaround time maybe, but not responsiveness. So they had this whole technology developed. When the time came to go to work on this radar system, it was clear that they wanted this thing to be completely up to date and computer driven. So the idea was you're going to have a computer based on whirlwind that would take signals from a whole bunch of brand new radars that they would do, process it, display it on one of those green round cathode ray tubes. I mean, the ones you see in movies, old movies, and uh, you know, process the signals. Then there would be an operator who would sit there and the operator, an Air Force uh, person, an operator would have a, have a keyboard to interact with it, but also a handheld device with which you could select things on the screen for closer examination. It was a light pen, not a mouse, but Think about it, uh, a person sitting before a screen that's operated by a computer, you know, with a keyboard and so forth, that's fully interactive, 
Does this sound familiar? Uh, this is where you know the modern every computer we interact with today. You know the laptop I'm uh, uh, sitting here looking at, our desktops, uh, even our mobile phones. Ultimately, the concept of that, not the literal technology, but the concept, traces back to that radar setup. Now, in order to make this, make sure there you know, weren't any problems built in, they had a whole team of psychologists working on human factors, and the head of that team was J.C.R. Licklider. Interestingly, I never knew him. He died before I even started work on the book. I may conceivably have met him at a conference earlier on. I remember somebody who looked like him, but that's so vague, I can't be sure. Anyway, he led a team of incredibly bright young psychologists, including se several that were later quite famous. You know, they were working on the human factors of this and, you know, of how to design a light pen and just how everything was supposed to work. Somehow this work, and I wish I could have interviewed Licklider because <laughs> I'd like to ask him, somehow that sparked an idea in his head. And that was that, uh, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention one thing about the uh, SAGE uh, computer system. It was called the Semi-Automated Ground Environment, SAGE. There were, the design called for radars across the entire northern tier and actually surrounding the entire United States. And they were actually built. Uh, and there were 23 radar centers for processing it uh, because you couldn't do it all from one. Because you had to do handoffs as if targets moved from one radar system to another, you had to have communications between these centers. So they developed a way to do this with uh, telephone lines. Uh, forget the operating speed. I think it was about 1,200 bits per second, which was radically fast in those days. And so this would uh, allow for the handoff and the transfer of data. Uh, it was all digital data, of course, from one center to another. So Licklider looked at this and had the idea, says, well, what if instead of processing radar images, we had centers that were you know, storage places for all forms of human knowledge? And you know, the program, instead of processing radar data, would be able to display that knowledge, that data in humanly meaningful forms. He was an old line experimentalist, so he was thinking in terms of plotting data points automatically. Uh, or, you know, creating, you know, various images. And then you could have, he imagined that each of these centers would be specialized for maybe a certain branch of knowledge and then, but they could communicate, use these phone lines to communicate. So he imagined this network of centers across the country with the collectively would contain all human knowledge and allowed to process and, you know, display it. Now, of course, Ten years earlier, ten years or more earlier, uh, Vannevar Bush, also from MIT, though he was in Washington at the time, had written what is now a famous paper conceiving of a MIMEX, which did more or less the same thing. It was a very different kind of technology. Licklider later said he hadn't, hadn't read Bush's paper at the time, but you know the idea is very, very similar. Uh, he only found out about it later, but. In any case, is uh, the earliest mention of this idea I could find was a speech he gave in 1957, Licklider gave, in which he described the truly sage system, as he called it. And the uh, this was, so far as I can tell, it's the first notion of what we would now call the Internet, uh, having all this knowledge available uh, at a screen and communicating. And most importantly, he had the notion of using the computer to not to replace people, but to help them you know, do the things that people aren't very good at. Uh, and the people are very, very good at setting goals and seeing relationships and recognizing patterns. When it comes to doing things like arithmetic or tabulating data or all these rote routine algorithmic things, we're pretty terrible. You know, our attention wanders, we make mistakes, you know, but computers are really good at that and really fast. So he said, okay, together we could be a symbiosis. And he began to talk about symbiosis. By 1960, he had moved to a firm called Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, 
which was also in Cambridge. And they actually had one of the first affordable commercial interactive computers. And it was the PDP-1, I believe, by the uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, which is, by the way, another spinoff of that same Project Sage. And he started experimenting with this, and he wrote a famous paper called Man-Computer Symbiosis, where he actually described this idea. He described, well, his idea was that you'd have a desk that was like this gigantic display screen and so forth. But it was basically a one-person computer terminal hooked in, and he imagined the whole thing, these things being networked. And he said, you know, if, if this vision comes true, we could imagine as many as four or five of these around the country just churning away. Lots of terminals tapped in. Now, this is all uh, well and good. You know, this was an idea that got a lot of attention and, you know, people were excited by it. But what really made the difference was that in 1962, the uh, Advanced Projects Agency of the Pentagon uh, had been formed after Soviet's launch of Sputnik in 58. They decided to, they needed to do some computer research. They didn't have any computer research at the time. Uh, they were particularly interested in computers for con command and control. And they hired Licklider to come down and start this program. And he had what was then a very generous budget. I think it was $10 million. And the way ARPA, and now, now it's called DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the way ARPA worked uh, those days and still was to have, they, they would hire very, very good people and say, okay, you choose the projects and we'll hold you responsible for the results, but we're not going to tell you how to do it. So you didn't have to worry about peer review or anything like that. So Licklider said, okay, well, uh, the government has just given me $10 million to realize my vision. Because if you're doing command and control, you've got to have responsive computing and, you know, symbiotic computing, et cetera. So by that point, he knew a lot of researchers around the country who were sort of going in the same direction. So he basically started funding all of them. You know, there was at MIT, he knew there were a bunch of, you know, really great people. So he funded something called Project Mac, which stood for man and computer. Uh, or machine-aided cognition, depending on what you uh, wanted. And they were, they were doing what was called time sharing, which was an advanced version of you know, the SAGE system, where you would have a central computer that divided its attention amongst whole bunches of terminals. But it was basically interactive computing. So they uh, were experimenting with that. There, were, you know, there was research in AI, funded people at Carnegie Mellon. Carnegie Mellon today is a powerhouse in computing precisely because he, uh, Licklider started investing in them in 62. People like Alan Newell, Herbert Simon, Alan Perlis. There was this strange, lonely guy from Stanford Research Institute, uh, now SRI International, uh, out on the West Coast, which was the wilderness for computing in those days. His name was Douglas Engelbart. It had very, very similar ideas for a long time. Couldn't get anybody to listen to him, but he, um, a lip glider gave him money. And so uh, Engelbart, of course, went on to invent huge swaths of what we now take for granted and the way we interact with screens, including the mouse. What you see is what you get, word processing, I mean, the whole works. And so, so it went, and he got this started. And once he got all of them on board, he started to worry about Tower of Babel effect, that everybody was going to go off and do their own, own thing. They'd write programs that wouldn't be able to talk to each other. You know, they, it would, just wouldn't add up to anything. Just be a bunch of interesting projects, but no coherence. So he wanted to have, give them a way to talk to each other. So it was, I believe, April 23rd, April 26th. Anyway, it was 1963. He sat down and dictated a memo, a very famous memo now. It's called To the Members and Affiliates of the Intergalactic Computer Network. And it's clear from the context and the title that he met, by network, he met the people. But what he described in that memo was a network made of wires to connect the people. And it was essentially the idea he had outlined as early as 1957. You know, based on the SAGE system, the interactive computing, that there would be a network to connect all the research centers, the ARPA research centers, and, you know, so that they could 
you know, share what they were doing and get their computers to talk to each other and so forth. Now, the technology of the day wasn't ready for that. And Licklider himself only stayed for two years, but he chose his own successor. And, you know, so the whole thing kept going. When you ask the people who built the ARPANET, which was a precursor for today's internet, it launched in 1969. If you ask them where they got the idea for it, they all, and I did, they all point back to that memo. You know, the idea was there, uh, waiting for technology to catch up in terms of computer power that they could afford. And when they started to build the ARPANET, which eventually launched in 1969, they were effectively following that vision. So part of Licklider's vision that he first outlined in the 1960 article, Man Computer Symbiosis, which had both personal computing and what we now call the internet, all traces back to that. And that ultimately traces back to that Sage computer system. By the way, uh, Sage also gave rise to a lot of other interactive applications, such as things like airline reservation systems and you know, all the uh, allied type things. Uh, point of sale computing, I mean, all of it traces back to that. So the ideas were nascent uh, as early as the 1950s, and they really started to flower. These, these ideas of symbiosis, human computer symbiosis, the ideas of networking, the computer as a communication device. Uh, that was an, an article that Licklider co-authored in 1968, which envisioned most of the applications we'd now find uh, on the internet, uh, you can find that vision was already uh, pretty common at places like MIT. I mentioned that Project Mac had, was pioneering time-shared computing, which was the only way they could think of to get personal computing in those days. Just parenthetically, in the early 1960s, or until the advent of microchips, which came along in the 70s, the economies of scale said you do best if you get bigger and bigger computers. So the idea was computing is great. Every One day, every city will have one. And the vision was you'd have some giant computer in, in the middle of the city and everybody would tap into it on uh, terminals. And as part of that vision, there uh, there's an article that came out in the Atlantic in 1964 that was outlining e-commerce everything. Uh, and by the way, Mac also had, Project Mac also had the first uh, email because as soon as you had a central computer, they instantly realized you could, people could start leaving messages for each other. Project Mac also had the first hackers, people who would come in and prank the programs. So they, they were pioneering you know, stuff that is very, very familiar now. And then, of course, what happened was uh, the microchips did come in uh, and computers got economical and you could design something that uh, actually working computer that you could uh, an individual could own. It was I remember in the early days, an Apple II cost something like three thousand dollars, which is a lot more then than it is now. But they um, it was possible. And so, you know, by the 80s, you had the personal computer revolution taking off. Also in the 80s, uh, and it's a fascinating story in its own right, the Internet started to uh, expand beyond the ARPA community and you know, essentially became the Internet we know now. That's actually a fascinating story that I only touch on in the book, but it's, it, it worked because essentially you got a bunch of government bureaucrats decided to make it work. Licklider died in 1990, so I ended the book there with the birth of the World Wide Web, which also happened almost simultaneously. So that's who J.C.R. Licklider was and you know, how some of those ideas started to come to fruition. What would you say was kind of the heart of his vision? You've mentioned symbiosis. Anything else you would add to that? So far as I can tell, and remember, I could never just ask him, but so far as I could tell, this notion of uh, machine-aided cognition, um, you know, the this, this symbiosis idea that, uh, remember, he was a neuroscientist, an experimental neuroscientist. He knew just how good people are at certain types of things. 
and how bad they are at others. He had, just because he spent so much of his, as he put it, spent so much of his life plotting data points and filing things, he had this sort of visceral notion that, you know, it'd be really nice if uh, we could automate some of this. And also uh, this notion of communication, you know, working together, uh, sharing ideas. I, I would say those were his, well, you could say it was part of the same vision, but it's, uh, let's call it two uh, pieces of that vision. Yeah, and, and you mentioned his his papers, I believe, from the 60s. And if you read them today, for example, Man, Computer, Symbiosis, and the Computer as a Communication Device, they're, to this day, profound. Just the depth and the way that he formulates his ideas are remarkable. So if someone, think about, think of a young sort of budding computer scientist today, how should they think about the context in which these ideas were sort of formulated back in the 1960s? How revolutionary were these ideas? Uh, they were the extremely time? revolutionary. Remember, the, the ARPA community of those days uh, that Licklider had formed and that grew from there, they felt like. I don't want to say rebels because they weren't quite that, but they were doing something radical and innovative. The dominant voices, uh, the forces in computing in those days, IBM, so forth, were still very heavily invested in you know, the uh, batch processing mainframe type of model where uh, where, where you submit the job and you do the processing and with that, not interactive. Uh, IBM came out with its System 360, I believe it was 64, it was early 60s anyway, and that was its, its predominant you know, line of computers for a long time and, you know, and upgrades to that. And that was very much a batch processing system. So, you know, the, the wisdom in the computer field was that's where it's at. And in all fairness, if you're processing payroll or something, that's what you want. Now, there were companies, particularly DEC, the digital equipment co company, that was pushing interactive computing, uh, and they were developing, by 68, they had what they called the mini computer, which was, they had a famous ad where it was sitting in the back seat of a Volkswagen convertible. Uh, it was something that you could, you know, a department could buy or even a lab. And that was interactive. And a lot of people labs did use it for experiments and things. And it, interestingly, uh, by the way, if you look at the famous popular electronics cover of January 1975 that advertised the first, what we now call personal computer kit, the Altair, the headline says the world's first personal mini computer. And if you look at it, it looks like a miniature version of a PDP-11. Uh, they were not, you know, it didn't have a screen or a built-in keyboard or any of that. Uh, that was stuff you could add, but, you know, it was, uh, it was a mini computer for people, hobbyists, to kick around. That's what it was for. But, of course, it ignited something very different. But anyway, uh, the, you know, the serious mainstream computer guys like uh, IBM and elsewhere were turning out mainframes and batch processing. That didn't begin to change until the 70s. Likewise, the networking was pretty radical all the way around. AT&T, which was the phone company in those days, was happy to rent phone lines to ARPA, you know, to carry this data, but, you know, there's never another government boondoggle, you know, the biggest waste of time they ever th saw. Uh, it was, it was antithetical to the way the phone system worked. I mean, that was designed around the notion of, you know, somebody places a call, you make a connection, and then after the call is over, you break that connection and, you know, then do something else. Uh, what ARPA essentially had to do was place a phone call, you know, multi-party phone call to all these sites and essentially never hang up. But it was not the way the phone system was designed. 
Uh, and AT T AT and T was just utterly uninterested in networking for years after that, until after the breakup. Actually, there was no internet, and there was no concept of a an information commons. Well, there was a concept because uh, that's essentially the idea that Project Mac was exploring, and that Communic uh, Licklider and others were thinking about. But there was no constituency for it other than a few hotheads. By the early 80s, it was 80s? Yeah. By the 80s, there were lots of, you know, the basic idea of packet switching, which is, you know, the, the technique that's used in the ARPANET and now the internet, that basic idea was being implemented in a lot of different ways, incompatible ways. DEC had uh, a net, Xerox had a network, IBM had its own network, and they, were, they didn't talk to each other. And frankly, the corporate customers who were using this sort of thing to communicate from their, to their various offices, field offices, they liked it that way. They didn't want outsiders to have a chance of getting in. You know, and they weren't wrong because, you know, look at all the problems we have now with hacking and data breaches. But the, the notion of an inf information commons in the early 80s had no constituency or no real constituency. And the only reason it won out historically, I mean, ARPA yeah, had all its sites and there were quite a few of them and they'd put some army bases on it too. But that was all DOD stuff. If you weren't funded by ARPA or a military base, you weren't on the ARPANET. Uh, on the other hand, a hell of a lot of people were funded by ARPA. And the way it happened, and this is where it gets to the bureaucrats making decisions, is that in the early 1980s, and I was a reporter then, so I remember this. In the early 1980s, the National Science Foundation uh, decided built a network of supercomputer centers that, uh, excuse me, let's call it a system of supercomputer centers that they're going to do about five of them, big supercomputers that would be dedicated solely to research. This was because uh, researchers had increasingly been using these massive machines to do simulations of galaxies and uh, many other things, but they had to beg time and take leavings from, you know, the real work, which was like, atomic bomb simulations and so forth. They'd have to go to places like Los Alamos. And it was catch as catch can, which was really holding back the whole field of computer simulation and you know, big data and all of that. So uh, NSF got, finally got talked into doing this. So they're going to build five centers, some of which still exist. You know, they've grown and evolved over the years. But then it was realized that you know, the, the model... NSF had for doing these sort of research centers was like the national observatories where you build a telescope on a mountaintop. Kitt Peak in Arizona uh, was the main one at the time. You build a telescope on a mountaintop somewhere and then astronomers would come. They'd, they'd get allotted time. They, they would have to submit proposals and compete and then get allotted so much time. And then they have to travel to the telescope and do their observations. I think initially it was assumed that's what would happen with the supercomputer centers, but then they realized, what's the point? You know, why go all the way to a supercomputer just to watch it grind through a simulation when you could submit your job uh, electronically? They knew about networks at that time. So uh, it was realized that you needed some sort of network to tie these supercomputer centers together. And by the way, this network also would have to go to essentially every campus in the country because any the researchers could come from anywhere, so they needed to uh, be able to submit from anywhere. And so essentially what they realized is they have to build a, a, a national network in order to make this work, but it would still be cost effective because otherwise you'd have to pay for people to travel all over the place. Then the question arose what network would it be? Remember, there are lots of alternatives, including a highly experimental, experimental um, protocol, um, communication protocol being pushed by Europe. Eventually, NSF decided, somewhat controversially, to go with the ARPANET protocols called TCP IP and is still what we use today. 
because it was already widely used on the ARPANET and it was, you know, it had been implemented, unlike, you know, the experimental one. Uh, so their implementation is already there. It was working. So NSF decided, despite objections from various quarters, we're going to go with the ARPANET protocol, TCP IP. And they did. The network launched in uh, 1985, as did the supercomputer centers. I think it crashed almost instantly just because of demand. And they had to keep upgrading, you know, the, you know, the speed. And anyway, uh, this was NSFNet. There had been rival networks. The Department of Energy had a magnetic fusion net. NASA had its own network, you know, for its researchers. You know, all these places had their own networks, just as ARPA had. But now, what's the point if you've got this network going to every campus anyway? You, know, you want to be able to talk to everybody. Eventually, the various departments, the various science agencies fell in line. They started using TCP IP also. And that's because a bunch of bureaucrats there decided that they were going to cooperate with that. There was an explicit group. It, if you think about it, different agencies cooperating like this is not a natural act. Uh, it, it just doesn't happen spontaneously. But the reason it did here is because of the nature of networking. If you don't cooperate, the bits don't flow. You don't all speak the same thing. The bits don't flow. So uh, they did. So eventually this thing just exploded. And by the way, at the same time, campuses were going crazy, building out uh, local area networks to go to every department and so forth. That's when that campus got networked. And the manufacturers must have followed suit because... Uh, business- oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, companies did too. And NSF, nobody wanted to manage this thing from Washington. It was just it was just too big. So they div- advised this system of you know, regional centers, which then delegated to you know, the local networks and so forth. And so this sort of distributed management system. And... NSF does not like to do operations. It just ties up money that they could use for basic research, which is their mandate. So they said, okay, we're going to keep going. But, you know, about 1990, I think it was, you know, we're going to basically quit funding this. And, you know, you regional centers, you've got to go out and make revenue on your own. And they did. And they turned into some of the first internet providers. You know, eventually it became possible to for other internet service providers to start up and start tapping in. That's why in the 1990s, starting in the early 1990s, you started everybody started getting internet. It's because NSFNet had done that and then spun it, uh, forced them to spin off and start going commercial. And then, of course, also in 1990, the at CERN. Tim Berners-Lee uh, invented the, the the World Wide Web, which was a way of visualizing, a visual way of navigating. And suddenly you had something to look at. So those two things, the World Wide Web plus the advent of these internet service providers, and of course, the internet, as we know, exploded after that. But it was because of far-sighted decisions made by bureaucrats in the 80s. Could we go back to the late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, the role Xerox Park played in the advent of personal computing? Well, yes. Xerox Park, of course, is an endlessly fascinating story. What I had not realized when I started working on the book, but quickly became apparent, was that, you know, as, as we mentioned, Licklider had sparked the formation of this. ARPA community of researchers, young researchers, you know, throughout the country, all these ARPA funded laboratories, all these grad students getting their degree with ARPA money and pursuing this dream of interactive computing in all its various ways, you know, with artificial intelligence and graphics and time sharing and all of that. So there was this like critical mass by the end of the 60s. And of course, a lot of them had participated in the deployment of the ARPANET, uh, which they thought, by the way, uh, was just a little sideline from their real work. 
whatever they say now, they, you know, if they're honest, they did not realize what it was they were creating. That became apparent only much later. In 19, I believe it was 1970, uh, the Xerox Corporation, which was, you know, the Apple computer of its day, you know, the innovative, forward thinking company, they had made zillions of dollars selling copiers throughout the 60s and were flush with cash and very ambitious. And they said, we're going to invent the office of the future, expand beyond copiers and, you know, th this automated computerized office of the future. And to do that, they created what became Zero, um, Xerox's Palo Alto Research Center Park. It was in Palo Alto, California. They did a number of things, but to, com to create the computer research part of it, they hired a fellow named Robert Taylor. Now, Taylor had been Licklider's acolyte uh, at ARPA. He had been one of Licklider's successors in the 60s. It was Taylor, by the way, who actually started what became the ARPANET project when he was manager. And they hired Taylor to form a research group to do computing, office computing. So he promptly hired a skim the cream of the best and the brightest, the most visionary uh, young researchers from the ARPA community and brought them in. And over the course of less than four years, building on uh, venue microprocessor technology and you know, networking, all that, they created the first recognizably modern personal workstation. It was called the Alto. The computer itself sat under the, your desk. It looks a lot, lot like a modern tower computer. It had a monitor that would sit on your desk and, of course, a keyboard and a mouse. They hired a lot of Engelbart people. The screen was first bitmap graphics screen. That it, that's the one we have now. That is, uh, you could address each pixel on the screen and uh, you could do your word processing on white, you know, black letters on white background instead of green letters on a black background. You could do any kind of graphics you wanted on that. They created the first word processing interactive word processing program, what you see is what you get program. That's the ancestor of Microsoft Word. They, they did lots of graphics and so forth. They did to tie the computers together and get them talking to the ARPANET node. They invented a uh, what's now called a local area network, Ethernet, that was invented by Bob Metcalf, who had helped install the first ARPANET node at MIT. And it was it was derived from it was, it was very similar to the packet switching ARPANET protocol, but specialized for working in the um, local environment. So they invented the Ethernet, and because they had a bitmap screen, they uh, needed to. And we're, we're doing uh, word processing with fonts and illustrations and so forth. They need to be able to print that out, print out anything that compute that computer could create. So they invented something called the laser printer that would do that. Essentially, it was a Xerox copy machine, but with uh, lasers writing on the drum to uh, create it. Uh, and that's essentially the laser printer. Inkjets came along later, but uh, the laser printers was the first. So they had all of that. You know, the question is, why didn't Xerox just start the personal computer revolution right there? And that's always been the question. Why didn't they come to dominate the computer market? Why was it Apple and IBM who did? There's lots of finger pointing about that. But I think the fundamental reason, and, and this is 2020 hindsight, uh, let, me, let me point out one thing. It's not like they didn't know about hobbyist computers. Remember, the Homebrew Computing Club was also in Palo Alto. It was meeting about two miles away at Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. And many of the park people would go over there. They were hobbyists too. They were putting together a vision. Their concept wasn't just a computer. Their concept was an entire work environment, which would have everybody with a computer tied together by Ethernet, hooked into laser printers, you know, hooked into a wider network using incredibly sophisticated you know, word processing uh, and 
other things, uh, all that you need for an office. And their strategy, which the kind of strategy that has worked many times for other technologies, is first they would sell to, you know, the Fortune 500, because it's pretty expensive. And then as volume increased, you know, they would you know, widen out and play as they go. And that was the auction strategy. They did, in fact, market the Alto and they sold things, but it was very expensive. Also, I talked to Chuck Thacker, who was, he did the hardware for the Alto. I believe he's still around. And he says, you know, when the Apple II came out, he got one and took it apart and to see what was inside. And it says the chip they were using to run the Apple II is the one that Xerox was using to operate the keyboard on the Alto. It was just so primitive and so limited. They couldn't imagine that anybody would prefer it to this beautiful vision that they had. In a sense, they might have been right, except for a piece of happenstance that a fellow named Dan Bricklin, I believe it was at MIT, had this idea for a piece of software that for some reason nobody had thought of it before. And it was what's now called a spreadsheet, basically a, a, a kind of a way for non-experts to, to program you know, what, uh, something themselves, a very versatile type of tool. Uh, it was extremely useful for accountants and so forth, but because he needed to write it and he, uh, didn't have the only computer he had available was an Apple II. He wrote it for the Apple II. He started marketing it. And a lot of people at companies, I mean, $3,000, this is a lot of, it was a lot of money then, still is, but you could justify it, you know, if you're a company. And if it's got something you really want to use, like a spreadsheet, well, you bought it. So Apple II sales exploded. And Xerox never pivoted. It, it kept following this thing. And you know, lots of finger pointing, but they their strategy wasn't crazy. It's just they got beaten by a much smaller, nimbler company. The thing about the Xerox vision is that if you're a company, if you wanted to go with the Xerox vision, you had to buy, you know, equip everybody and make a total commitment. And by the way, they didn't have spreadsheets. That, uh, the software guys at Xerox said, yeah, we just didn't think of it. We're researchers. We, we had no reason to think about that. I mean, they made one later, but you, so you had to make this total commitment. Whereas if you didn't know much about computing. Uh, you could buy an Apple II to kick it around and then run a spreadsheet on it. And, you know, an Apple, II, those early Apple IIs were awful. You know, you, you bought a monitor. It was green letters on black, hard on the eyes. Uh, you had to buy a keyboard separately, so forth, but you could run that damn spreadsheet. And then IBM got into the act and it was IBM. And I almost fucked it up too, but it was, you know, the IBM PC took off and became, you know, the standard and you know, the very familiar story of they more or less created Microsoft or didn't create it, but they, uh, you know, turned it into a giant, a software giant. And, you know, the, you know, it's a very familiar story from there. But Xerox wasn't quite able to make it work, even though they had this absolutely beautiful vision, which, in fact, is what we have now just had to grow up separately. What about incentives? Reading your book seems like there was a tension between short-term financial motivations and sort of long-term, I guess, sustainability. seems like the, uh, the most profitable division of Xerox wasn't necessarily aligned with this direction and there was sort of a conflict. Well, yeah, there was a lot of that too. The, there was one manager who had say they were going to do a demonstration of the laser printer at a number of sites around the Bay Area. Just because, you know, if you've never had something, you don't miss it, right? They wanted to get this into people's hands so they could try it out and, you know, uh, see how well it worked and, you know, maybe make design modifications. But anyway, let people know what was possible. So they had it all set up. These were basically, Xerox machines modified to use the laser to uh, write on the drum, and then you print things out. And this manager who was 
a real spreadsheet guy, uh, so to speak, uh, even though it wasn't electronic, uh, but he was a real numbers guy. And he ran the numbers and said, you know, if we do this, we're going to lose money on every one of these printers. And so he nixed the demonstration, even though as they people kept screaming at him, making money on this isn't the point. This is a demonstration of a whole potentially new market. But he had the authority, and so the demonstration never happened. So that was an opportunity loss. It was that kind of thing. There was there's a famous story. Uh, Xerox had a technology fair to show off uh, a lot of things that uh, Park had developed. Is this book a return? It may have been. Yes, I, th- I think so. And this was about what was it, seventy seven, seventy nine? I forget the exact year. You know, but they were trying to market the Alto and so forth. They were going to show off the whole thing. So they had all these executives and their families wandering around. They had a place where you could work with the Alto. And the famous story is you know, the researchers watched and all the executives who always had secretaries to type for them, male executives, were just looking at it and says, oh, it does that? Oh, Okay. Whereas their wives, most of whom had worked as secretaries, were using the Alto and raving about it. But the problem <laughs> is the wives weren't making the decisions. The decisions were being made by executives who had never typed in their lives. In fact, that was considered unmanly and uh, undermining your leadership and so forth. Yeah, you know, researchers who had always happily done their own thing anyway, uh, they had no problem with it. But the executives who were making the decisions... And so it's not that they nixed the Alto. They did market the Alto. It's just they had no real understanding of it. And uh, you can say, well, uh, I mean, it's a classic case of a missed opportunity. Uh, On the other hand, you know, it's hard for any of us to come up with, to to really appreciate new ideas when it's staring you in the face. This This is a failing, I think, we should all be aware of. The trick is to recognize powerful new ideas without opening your mind so far that the wind blows through. Because you know, there are a lot of dumb ideas out there, too. So. One other period, be the 40s and the 50s, prior to Licklighter taking probably some inspiration from from that period, maybe it's one Newman, maybe it's uh, Van Ever Bush, or even Turing. Uh, well, there. What happened during the war was that Cambridge, Massachusetts, especially around MIT, because of the war work they had done, was this hotbed of new ideas. In particular, MIT had become the site of what's uh, called the radiation lab, which was developing this new technology. The technology had been invented in Britain, but they had their hands full. So uh, a lot of the development of radar technology done at MIT, and that meant it, rapid advancements in electronics and antenna design and you know, microwave processing so forth. By the way, the microwave oven was invented there. They noticed it made water hot. And you know, you get all these incredibly smart people and you know, working together, breaking totally out of their 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 mental boundaries because they were working on this immensely practical problem and interacting with other disciplines in ways they never had. It sparked all kinds of ideas. There was something like ultimately there was something like 10 Nobel prizes that came out of the radiation lab, not to mention microwave ovens. And it's something I wrote just recently, I, I realized that one of the people who discovered the microwave background radiation in the sixties had worked at the radiation lab and invented a microwave detector that was later what they used. So it's that kind of thing. A lot of advances in neuroscience because they had instrumentation that could get to understand the brain better, uh, record from individual neurons. Huge advances there, as advances in computing. It was just this uh, incredible ferment. One guy that was particularly influential on Licklider and was a mathematician named Norbert Wiener, 
one of the world's great characters. The famous story about Wiener was he encountered somebody uh, walking along the sidewalk and they chatted. And then Wiener asked the guy, uh, which way was I going when you stopped me? And he said, well, from over there, says, and Wiener said, oh, okay, I've already had lunch then. Yeah, he was just, he was one of a, a genuinely great mathematician um, and had been even before the war. Uh, during the war, he was working on uh, guidance systems for artillery and he started hitting upon the ideas of uh, what he came to call cybernetics. That was a word he invented. He was really taken with notions of, you know, computing and messaging and what we now call information theory. And he came to believe that this was a whole, uh, in feedback loops, and this was a whole new uh, field of inquiry, which he decided to call cybernetics. He, he originally was wanted to stress the notion of message passing and communication, uh, and uh, was looking for a, a Greek word, a Greek or Latin word to indicate that. Unfortunately, the word is angelus. And you know, a new science of angelics wasn't exactly what he had in mind. So, so he uh, came up with uh, cybernetics, which is derived from the word for steersman, you know, guidance. Being a genius, he had many very profound insights uh, about this. And he was very influential in Licklider. He, um, the cybernetics movement for a while was this whole movement. It got subsumed into other things later, though there's still a cybernetic society and so forth. So uh, Wiener was very influential. There are also ideas floating around uh, Alan Turing's ideas uh, about computability uh, and so forth had begun to be appreciated when he published what was now called the Turing machine in 36. Nobody paid attention. Also, there was a brilliant young man named Claude Shannon who invented what was the first to really quantify and start proving serious theorems about information, information theory. He didn't actually invent it. You know, the idea, some of the ideas had been there, but he really showed what a mathematically powerful idea it was. Uh, Shannon had also had a very intriguing insight uh, back in the 30s. He, I think it was 1936, he had graduated from the University of Michigan and was debating over whether to go into industry or go on for a higher degree. And then he saw uh, at the University of Michigan a postcard job advertisement. That's how they did it in those days. From MIT, looking for uh, someone who would do a work-study program at MIT on uh, essentially analog computing. Uh, this was Vannevar Bush hired him. Vannevar Bush had pioneered uh, an analog computing, which you essentially built a sort of mechanical model of your problem and then use that to solve it, you know, to two or three decimal places. Um, and it was, at the time, the fastest way to solve a lot of equations. And Shannon got the job, and he got there, and he had this, it was called the differential analyzer, and it was this bunch of rods that we could turn and had gears and pulleys and so forth. It was a way to make models of differential equations. And Shannon's job was to keep this thing running. And they had a bunch of motors, and there was this whole panel of switches that would turn things on and off to connect things and uh, to coordinate the motors. And he, you know, the switches would go bad sometimes, and he had to figure out, or they'd be set improperly, and he had to figure this out. And he realized something. He, in the senior year, the last senior year, just by happenstance, he'd taken a course in symbolic logic, which talked about true and false and ways to combine that, you know. A and B, you know, truth tables, so forth. Anybody who's taken logic remembers those. Implication, if then, or statements. How to combine true and false statements and whether the combined statement is true. And he realized that when you had switches in series, it worked like an and statement. When you had switches in parallel, it worked like an or statement. And if you wire the switch up backwards so that things were open instead of closed, it worked like a knot in logic. And nobody else had ever thought of this. And he realized, and this was his master's thesis, which is probably one of the most widely quoted master's theses of the 20th century. And basically, he worked all this out and showed 
that you could instantiate any statement in symbolic logic as a circuit of switches. And among other things, so he didn't make a big deal of this, if you can do that, then you can build a device that can decide, make decisions. If X, then Y. It's actually not even hard to do. You know, it's, it's a matter of doing or and not. But it means that a, you could take what was considered, mathematically considered to be a completely cognitive thing, you know, logic. Even though it's mathematized, it was just a cognitive and instantiate it in a physical device. That thesis is the foundation ultimately for all of digital computing, that you can not only calculate numbers, but you can make decisions, branch programs, all of that. That was the thesis. And Shannon was the same guy who 10 years later, 12 years later, went on to invent the notion of information theory. So uh, there, was, there were all these ideas just floating around at that time, appreciated mainly in retrospect, but okay. You know, it was just this rich ferment. And I spent a lot of the early part of the book, yeah, I was fascinated to learn about it. And I had I vaguely known of a few things, but I hadn't realized how it all tied together and was part of this ferment. We hope you enjoyed the conversation. For more information and latest updates, visit us at luminary.fm or follow us on Twitter at Luminary FM. Please subscribe to the podcast, pop us an iTunes review, and share with friends. Don't forget to check out the show notes. And a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this episode by the hosts and the participants are solely those in independent capacity and do not in any way represent the views from any organization, company or management they may be associated with and thank you for listening.